Well, that seems like a perfect time to start the 58th Sunday Assembly in San Diego. <laughs> Welcome to everybody. Before we get started, I want to make sure you know that we have a media-free zone, so we are digitally recording this event. So if you do not want to participate in that, please sit in this area over here. And now, as always, I'm going to turn you over to the glue that holds things together, the peerless Mr. Mark Paul Svensson. Mark Paul. I don't know where I got that. Mark Paul. Okay, we are going to embark on yet another adventure in song this morning. We are going to sing The Elements. Yeah, those ones. Remember the chart? Right? Well, Tom Lear, who was a uh, satirical songwriter back in the 50s, 60s, uh, wrote and uh, took a... Um, Gilbert and Sullivan tune took the modern major general song, you know, -da 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 and he wrote all the elements to that. We are now going to sing that, and we're going to do it very slowly, but I'm going to give you a couple of tricks. Let's hit the first slide. <clears throat> so, here you have a series of words. The first thing I would do is scan them quickly so you'll know what, so they're familiar. So when you get to them the first time, they're not going to make you crazy. Okay? Okay, got it? Now, when you sing the song, if you sing antimony, you should be looking at arsenic. If you sing aluminum, you should be looking at selenium. Because if you're looking ahead, you'll get it. Otherwise, you will be hopefully lost. We'll start it slow. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium. Hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and rhenium. Nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium. Iron, emery, sienna, the rubium, uranium, europium, zirconium, plutonium, vanadium, lanthium, and osmium, and astentine, and radium, golden protactinium, and idium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. You are doing awesomely. There's yttrium, ytterbium, mycenium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, neobium, meridium, strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuthonium, and beryllium, and barium. There's holium and helium and hafnium and erbium, phosphorus and francium and chlorine, also terbium, manganese and mercury, molybdenum, magnesium, dysprosium, scandium, cerium and cesium, and lanthanum, and cesium, and radium, promethium, potassium, polonium, tantium, and terbium, and terbium, and terbium, and cadmium, and calcium, and curium, and curium. So you have to remember the chords too, so there's Sulfur, California, Permanian, Brickill, and also Mendelivian, and Sulfur, Arm, Krypton, Neon, Radon, Tino, Zinc, and Rhodium, and Corian, and Cobalt, and Sodium. Got it? Back up. You guys are, you guys are good, actually. I'm so impressed. You're actually better than me. You should all come up here and sing it. I'll go sit out there. Here we go. Are you ready? There's... Again. 
So if I understand the lyrics are yum. So that's how I got it. Well, welcome to Sunday Assembly. Sunday Assembly is a secular non-religious community that meets monthly to hear great talks, to connect for community events, to uh, sing silly songs, to have some snacks, but mostly we're here to celebrate together this one life that we know that we have. The theme for Sunday Assembly, or the motto for Sunday Assembly is live better, help often, and wonder more. And uh, every Sunday Assembly has a theme. The theme for this Sunday Assembly is confirmation. My name is Stephen Soden. I'll be your MC for today. Um, I see some new faces here. How many by show of hands is your first time to Sunday Assembly? If you wouldn't mind, we'll give those people a high five. Welcome so much. Thank you for being here. Um, I do want to let you know that we do have child care. Um, for we can watch uh, children uh, age one and a half up. These are professional uh, people who will watch your children. They've been doing it for, uh, gosh, almost five years now, and they do a great job of it. Um, we're uh, five years, three months, and two days in uh, since Sunday Assembly started, so thank you for being here today on this blustery winter day in Southern California. Boy, we've got it good, I'll tell you. Um, we're going to start off with uh, Life Happens, so this is a chance for us to just uh, um, share what things that are happening in our lives. Um, I have uh, 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 let, somebody's letting us know that Lelia, well, I'm assuming this is Lelia or her mother, uh, she won a school award for being good at science and she got a trip to Tesla. That is fantastic. Is she in the other room there? Oh man, I must congratulate her on that. That is really cool. From Lynn Warner, she made her debut as a licensed psychologist on February 1st and 2nd. And uh, she had a wonderful time teaching uh, 70 people about, about smart recovery. Lynn, uh, where are you? Congratulations. On that, I hear that went really well. And um, I'll throw my own in there, because I, uh, I don't normally do this, but um, my, uh, my, my son asked, uh, he's 23 years old, he out of college this year, uh, if he could take a vacation with me. So we're taking a vacation in April. I'm very excited about that. I'm a little, little nervous about uh, what conversation I'll have with my son for the week that we're together, but uh, we'll figure it out. He lived with me for 18 years. We can do this. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and now we're going to have help happen. So I think Alexis, uh, you're going to come up and do that today? Jen. Jen. Alexis is going to wing it as Jen is not here today. So sorry about that. I wing it every time I'm up here. So um, I think Jen was going to do stand up for kids, but since I'm here, we did um, Feeding the Homeless last night, and it was a big success. We had a lot of people show up, despite it started sprinkling on us just a little. Um, we we're hoping this is the last rainy one we do, but um, we had uh, quite a few people in the line come up when we were still building sandwiches and handing out stuff. People brought blankets, Sunday Assembly people brought blankets because they missed the blanket drive. And that was so nice because they all came up and they're like, oh, there's still blankets. And it was like, oh, I, I'm going in the shelter tonight, but my friend's not, or, you know, all this. Um, I think people that live rough are the kindest, most supportive community I've ever personally met because they are there for each other. You're handing out a sandwich and they're like, I need one for my friend. He has mental illness. I need one for my other friend. Or someone came up to us and was signing, and he had so many interpreters who did not know sign language that were just friendly other people sleeping next to him going, he probably wants a sandwich. And he probably, I'm like, no, no, we have someone here who is fluent in ASL, so they can help him out and get him what he needs. Um, we also <laughs> were joined this last yesterday, this first time ever, by our local In-N-Out Burger employees who randomly got off work, paid for it out of their own pocket, made the burgers themselves, just employees, this wasn't run by the corporation, and came over and we had cheeseburgers to hand out for the first time ever. So that was amazing. So good times, join us. Uh, next one's in two weeks. Wow, that's outstanding. Thank you so much for that. Well, well, uh, well winged. We have a reading today uh, of The Pale Blue Dot by Carl Sagan, and that is read by Victoria De La Torre. Victoria? Hi, everyone. I'm going to read you one of my favorite readings from Carl Sagan. <clears throat> Pale Blue Dot. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of. 
every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and our suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor, and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage on a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they can become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they were to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position, position in this universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that, will help, that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the, only known, is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is, perhaps, no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits that this distant image of our tiny world, to me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thanks. Well done, thank you. So, uh, um, because I'm entirely fallible, I skipped over the icebreaker. And I know the ice is already broken, but I figured, you know, it would just be fun to do it anyways. And uh, I, I don't know, I may not be very good at this, but um, we're going to give a, I'd like to just try and play a game we're going to call, it's called Simon Says, which we'll be playing starting now. And I know uh, Simon Says is not for everybody, but this means that every uh, command, every statement, every request must be preceded by Simon Says. If you do anything else, then you're out. So um, I know not everybody's going to want to play Simon Says, but if you do like to play Simon Says, please stand up. Okay, you're all out. <laughs> Simon says, but uh, but uh, I think I, I think I'm loud enough here. I'm going to do that. So thank no, you. No, please use mine. Okay. All right. Well, those of you who uh, play Simon uh, still want to play Simon says. I don't. I think it was somebody that we that didn't stand up and they knew there was supposed to be Simon says. Okay. So you guys are out now too. Very good. So now, if you want to play Simon says, Simon says, please stand up. Oh yes, a much smaller group. Okay. Very good. All right. So. Um, uh, 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 let's uh, let's uh, do this. Uh, so uh, Simon says, "Let's we're marching. We're marching. We're going to march." Simon says, "March." Simon says, "March." Simon says, "Left face." Left is the other way. Left is the other way. Left is the other way. Very good. Simon says, "Left face." Front face. Simon says, "Stop." Simon says, "Touch your head." Simon says, "Touch your chin." Simon says, "Touch your cheek." Simon says, "Touch your hips." Okay, you're out, you're out, you're out, sit down, sit down, I saw you, sit down back there, okay, all right. All right, so some of you, um, I think with what's left, we have enough of a group that's a, small, that's a smaller group here, so why don't you come on up, come on up please, if you're left over, please, come on up, all right, come on up, come on up, come on up, okay, very good, all right, you're all out. Okay, those of you who are left, come on up, Simon says come on up, Simon says come on up, if you're left, Simon says come on up. All right, only the, uh, only, the, only the strong survive. <laughs> we have a much, uh, much smaller group here. Okay, what is your name? Dina. Dina, you're out. Go ahead and take a seat. <laughs> Thank you. Simon says, what is your name? Mark. Simon says, what is your name? 
louder? Rachel. Okay, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to finish this game off this way with, a, with an exciting game of Rochambeau. So that will be the uh, finisher for our icebreaker today. So that's a uh, rock, paper, scissor for oh. those of you in the uh, America. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so um, the, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to, um, uh, Simon says is over and uh, you may uh, complete your actions without saying Simon says. So um, yes, absolutely. It's not a trick. Uh, so uh, what we'll do is just a uh, rock, paper, scissors to see who the champion is. And for this championship, we have quite a prize. Uh, no, we don't. Um, but uh, so um, th this is going to go one, two, three. Okay, so one, two, three. So the one, two, three is a so one, two, three. Do you know how to play rock, paper, scissor? Okay, this is going to be great. So you're going to go, I'm going to explain to you. It's real simple. So this is a scissor. Scissor. That's a rock. That's a paper. Yeah, easy. So uh, paper beats rock. Rock beats scissor. Scissor beats paper. Okay, so you just pick one of those. What's that? Two out of three. Two out of three. Two out of three. Yeah, that seems good. So we're going to go one, two, three, boom. So you put whatever you want to put out, okay? All right, so one, two, three. All right, so that's a winner for you. We have one more. Two out of three. One, two, three. Uh, paper beats rock. That's it. You're the winner. Diane is the winner. The champion. Okay, we have an amazing speaker today, um, and uh, setting the record for speaking at Sunday Assembly was Mr. Uh, Brian Keating. He's a professor of physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences in the Department of Physics at the University of California, San Diego, uh, go Tritons, um, where he leads the ACT Center for Experimental, Co Cosmo Experimental Cosmology. He's also the Associate Director of the Arthur Clark Center for Human Imagination. No stranger to extreme conditions, Professor Keating's experiment, BICEP, was located in the South Pole and received worldwide uh, attention when it prematurely announced that it was considered one of the greatest discoveries of all time, evidence of the so-called theory of inflation. This episode and its aftermath became the subject of his first popular science book called Losing the Nobel Prize, a story of cosmology, ambition, and the perils of science's highest honor, published in April 2018, uh, W.W. Norton. Um, upon its release and losing the Nobel Prize, won uh, numerous accolades, including being named one of Amazon's best nonfiction books of the month, uh, April 2018. So um, Brian uh, is uh, contented to stay after and sign copies of the book um, back, back on the table. And included with the book is this genuine imitation gold uh, uh, bookmark, so you'll want to get that. So that'll be exciting. Um, please welcome Brian Keating. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Laura, Chris. It's great to be back here, setting the record for three times here at the Sunday Assembly. It's better than a Nobel Prize, I'll tell you that. Well, I wouldn't know, actually. As you <laughs> So uh, I want to talk today about this little device, this device that's so compact and transformative it can both fit in your pocket and move the entire planet as it did about 409 years ago tonight, more or less tonight. Galileo Galilei, the great maestro of northern Italy in 1610, was using this device in March and February of, 20, of 1610 to look up at celestial objects through a telescope. And no one had ever done that before. Be like, oh, I have this cell phone camera, and I've never thought to take a picture of my kids. And then I did it, and it became famous and invented Instagram. So he used this tiny little telescope to look up and see things, as I said, no one had ever seen before. And it's amazing. Nobody had ever thought to do this before uh, with a telescope. Even even though he didn't invent the telescope, he really used it in the way that, you know, if you like, it was intended to be used, if, if such a thing could have teleological purpose. And in so doing, in one of his first observations in January of, 20, of 1610, he saw the moon, and he saw four other moons. Although he didn't realize it at first, it took him all of about three days to realize what he was seeing. And you can see it on the upper, upper left over there. He showed consecutive still frames from one of the most exciting or boring still frame animation, stop motion animations in the history of the planet. So if you look at those images from January 10th, 11th, and 12th, the first two kind of show 
the big planet Jupiter and next to it these two stars, so big deal. I would have stopped there to tell you the truth and not come back the next day on January 12th, but that's when the action started to happen. He saw that those stars were still kind of attached to Jupiter, but they were on other sides and they were, seemed to be in a different arrangement than the two previous nights. He went back another night and he kept doing this for like months on end. He has in the Starry Messenger this book that really transformed history in, no other, in a way no other book has until my book, uh, that this, <laughs> this diagram showed and he realized what he was seeing. He was seeing another solar system or a miniature solar system on edge. He was seeing these planetary beings, these stars orbiting around the giant king of the planets, Jupiter. And in so doing, as I said, he really displaced humanity's notion of the Earth's centrality in the universe. The whole solar system was basically the universe to Galileo. He saw many other things, the craters on the moon, the phases of Venus at the bottom there, the ears, as he called it, of Saturn, which you can see there. But nothing else really changed the world the way the images of Jupiter did. Uh, let's see, this is not clicking, click. There we go. So let me go back up. Maybe I'll take it over here. I should use your clicker. Okay, maybe you can plug that in there. I don't know if it's the clicker or this yes. HDMI device. So shown there is, yeah, should work. So you got the laser, let me try blinding people in the audience. Uh, so let's see if this works. I think it's, I guess the Macs that don't like this new adapter. Yeah, that'll be great. Okay, uh, next one, next one. And there we go. So what he showed was that the universe was actually not oriented in the way that's shown on the left as Ptolemy and Aristotle had believed for thousands of years, but instead that the universe had this other sort of notion to it where there was multiple centers to the universe. It wasn't just the earth being the center, it was the earth, Jupiter, and the sun could rightfully claim to be central to the organization of the universe. Next. And so uh, in the beginning he did what all great you know, thinkers do, especially those with many illegitimate children and many ex-wives and lovers to support. He tried to make money with it. So he did what you could do here and you could look out the window here and you can see things really far away. In particular, we could see like a, a you know, Soviet flotilla coming towards us days ahead of time. Of course, for them in Venice, where it's shown there on this image here, he was useful, he was showing the Venetian Senate how useful this telescope would be to remove the stealth factor that distance provided before. So in other words, they used to have people sitting on the shore watching, maybe in the tower, watching with their naked eyes to see if a navy was coming to attack the Venetian lagoon. Instead, with this, he could see them a day ahead of time. Imagine the advance notice that that would provide. And the Senate realized that. They immediately doubled his salary and gave him, and gave him lifelong tenure at the University of Padua, uh, which is great. You know, professors are very envious of that, getting, you know, doubling your salary and, and getting tenure all on the same day. So, uh, so they loved him and they gave him these great, great things. And he, for a while, became rich by doing the following, not making copies of the telescope, but doing you know, what I did to become rich, which is to write books. So next slide. So he went on a book tour, and he didn't really leave, uh, he didn't really leave Italy. There he is. So that's our, our modern day inspiration there. There's Kim. Uh, and he went on a book tour. And he knew he could print massive numbers of copies of the book, but he couldn't make massive amounts of telescopes. And besides, if he did, he'd be giving away his secret monopoly. And he didn't want to do that. So he kept these discoveries secret, even from his friend Kepler, who had provided much of the information that he used to formulate the idea or provide information to supplement his observations. So he tried to make money next. What happened next was not so great. Uh, he had so much success from this first book, or well, it was, actually it was technically a second book. He wrote another book in which he pitched the entire idea of the Copernican model in complete, in complete opposition to what Pope Urban, who had been friendly to him when he published the, uh, the Starry Messenger. Urban said, fine, you can talk about it, but don't talk about, don't talk about it in a way that anyone can understand. You're only allowed to publish in Latin, which most people didn't know back then, as opposed to today, when everybody knows Latin. Um, <laughs> he wrote it in Italian, the dialogue, the dialogue on two world systems, and he had a conversation between somebody who was named Salvati, who was brilliant, and then there was an idiot named Simplicio, the simpleton, and it turned out not so smart for Galileo, because he put all of the Pope's arguments in the mouth of Simplicio. 
So that would be like, you know, using, you know, your leader of the country here and putting all your dumb ideas in his mouth. Anyway, we're not going to talk about politics today. Uh, Let's keep going. Next slide. So he got imprisoned in his house, but what he had seen really was too much to take back. He was able to transform the earth from being the center of the solar system, and he moved it to the sun. And he saw beyond the orbit of the sun and all the orbits of the planets out to the nebula and the stars, which we now know to be primarily composed of dust. And I'll talk a little bit mostly about that today. Next slide, please. So we look out with telescopes that are giant versions of this. Most that don't use lenses, but the telescope I'll talk about today actually did use a lens. Um, But we use a Hubble telescope. We see out into the universe things that look very different from planets, the sun, the moon. These are the objects you see. This is the cosmic wallpaper. Okay, if you look deep into the universe, this is what you see. Every speck of light here is a galaxy, pretty much. There's like one or two stars, perhaps, in the foreground in our own Milky Way. Everything else is an island universe of its own with 100 billion stars. Each one that we know nowadays could have as many as 1,000 planets, each star or planetesimal, small things, asteroids big enough, bigger than our moon, uh, just like our solar system does. And we know now that perhaps there's 10 to the 22nd stars or planetary objects in the observable universe. So that's what you see with a, with a visible light telescope. On the next slide, I want to see what you, show you what you see if you have a microwave telescope. It looks very different. You see these splotches of color. And I have a beach ball over there. I did. Pass it over. Here we go. We got a beach ball here. This is what the universe looks like if you have microwave eyes and you're some omniscient deity that some of you don't believe in, but but some of you might. Uh, And you're looking down at our universe and you see this colorful splotch. These are not actual true colors. These are computer and uh, graphed images of what you would see if your eyes were sensitive to microwaves. You see hot spots and cold spots. The hot spots will correspond to places where there's less matter on average than other places, and the cold spots will be places where gravity is so intense because there's more matter, energy, and so forth in those regions. This bright band around the center is really the subject of my talk and what bespoiled my chances at winning a Nobel Prize. What do you think this is here? This is the Milky Way galaxy. This is the Milky Way galaxy as you'd see it if you had microwave vision. So this is a depiction made by NASA, and this ball is to Next slide, please. And so now we know we can see even farther back. When you look back out into space, if nothing's in your way, you're looking back in time. Light travels one foot per nanosecond. That means if you're one foot, you're one row behind somebody else, you'll appear one nanosecond younger. Now is when most of the older people start moving back, but it, you know, it only works in nanosecond increments, so you know, good luck there. But if you look back, there's no planets, no people, no stars, nothing in your way, no galaxies. You can see back to the edges of space which in some cosmological models is when time itself began. And that moment of time we believe is called inflation, which launched the explosive expansion of space and time that we now call the Big Bang. Next slide, please. But that's hidden from our view. And of course, astronomers are kind of greedy. Uh, The reading said that astronomers are humble. Thank you, but we're not that humble. We're the most humble people ever lived. No, we're not. Uh, (laughs) We're far from humble if you've ever been to a faculty meeting. Uh, You'll learn that. But uh, if you want to look back into space, you don't want to stop even when this image was made. This image was made not a billion years after the Big Bang, not a million years after the Big Bang, about a half a million years after the Big Bang. But we want to go farther and farther back in time, maybe to the first second after the Big Bang, maybe to the first nanosecond when the universe could be maybe at most a foot in diameter, maybe a trillion, trillion, trillion times smaller than that. And that's actually the goal of the telescope I'm going to show you about uh, a slide after this. This is a depiction, and that's fine, of how these fluctuations came to be is the largest open question in cosmology. How did you come to have a universe that had galaxies and planets in it is actually much easier to understand than how the universe came to have these splotches in it. Because those galaxies form from these splotches. Remember I said some of the regions that give off less energy are colder, denser, The other regions that are colored orange here are hotter, less dense, more tenuous. So once you make something have a broken symmetry, that allows something to aggregate in that particular place, like a cloud seeding a raindrop. But the question is, how did you get that little particle for the cloud to seed upon in the first place? The seeds, the origin of the seeds, we think is something called inflation. And the inflation is depicted there that's a field that permeated all of space-time. Like the Higgs boson is permeating this room, giving more mass to some of us and less mass to others of us. That field is called the inflaton, and it existed a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. Or so we think, but we're not sure. 
We want to look out like Galileo did and prove or disprove the existence of this phenomena known as inflation. Next slide. To do that, we use not waves of light, because this is the oldest light in the universe, half a million years after the Big Bang. We can't use visible light. Everything was in the form of heat and energy. Instead, we use waves of gravity, something called gravitational radiation or gravitational waves, first discovered on Earth in the year, uh, in the year 2015. So the equivalent of Galileo looking up at the heavens, but for waves of gravity, came when the LIGO experiment detected two black holes crashing together a billion, 400 million light years away. And that detection opened up a new window on the universe. We're trying to push that back from a billion years ago all the way back to 13.8 billion years plus a fraction of a second. So back to the very most early moment of time. Next slide. To do that, we built a telescope, a refracting telescope, a telescope that uses lenses like these, except you can't see through these lenses with microwave vision unless you have microwave vision. And these lenses are coupled to detectors that are very different than your eye because they can sense polarization of light. So I go through in the book exactly why polarization is important, what it encodes, and why it's useful and unique. Uh, and the other thing that's different about this than your eyes is that these work about 454 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, so colder than we are right now. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> that's the instrument. Instead of Galileo putting on the tripod, we had to put it on this massive mount that was about 10,000 pounds and could rotate around in a few seconds, point any location on the sky. Unfortunately, we couldn't keep it here in San Diego. Next slide. We took it down to the bullseye at the bottom of the world, a place called the South Pole, Antarctica. It's the southern axis on which the entire Earth is spinning. Next slide, please. There, people first reached in the year 1911, over 100 years ago. For the first time, an entire continent had never been reached, let alone the South Pole. For many thousands of years, people didn't even know if it existed or not, Antarctica, and they knew nothing about the South Pole. And so here were two teams that got there. The team on top used a revolutionary technology known as the dog, and any of us who have dogs will know how useful they are. The British team below did not want to use dogs for a very uh, clear reason, which is that they knew that the Norwegians would eat the dogs, and they knew the Brits uh, would not, and they weren't willing to eat the dogs, actually. So the team, guess which team won? <laughs> the team with the more advanced technology. Those, the, they, they got to the South Pole first, next slide, and they ate the ate the dogs. Unfortunately, the South Pole is still an extremely dangerous place to visit. All the people in the bottom image died. They froze to death almost 107 years ago this week, trying to get back to the last stockpile of food and fuel just a few miles away from the base that they had departed from. So they all froze to death, Robert Scott. And as I say, it's, it's just as dangerous today as this image of me last time I was there depicts. So go ahead. So penguins look cute, but they're not. Okay. <laughs> Everyone thinks penguins are cute. I say, if you can't decide between having chicken or fish, have penguin. <laughs> Next slide, please. So there I am. Take a selfie. Next slide. There's a telescope frozen away there. It operated for three years under Antarctic skies, which are dark six months of the year. There's only one day and night per year at the South Pole. If you want to go there and someone says, just spend one night, you know, be very careful. It could be the longest night of your life. And we detected this pattern of polarization that's indicative of the interaction of light with gravitational waves, which seemed to indicate for the very first time that human beings, this is two years before LIGO's discovery was announced, that we had discovered the first evidence for gravitational waves beyond, beyond uh, the, our Milky Way galaxy, and the first evidence for the unification of gravity with quantum mechanics in the inflationary epoch. An astounding claim, which, next page, was published on the uh, newspaper of record, the San Diego Union Tribune, uh, and, <laughs> and, of course, this other paper in New York City, where I used to live. I like the bottom headline. It was on every newspaper, but it was in The Economist. I like the bottom one, because it's like some dude is just like watching the origin of the universe. Oh, wow, the universe. There. Okay, next one, please. But all was not well. See, remember what I said before? We wanted to see these waves of gravity, because they would indicate the presence of inflation, which would push back the frontiers of human knowledge, as one observer, Lawrence Krauss, who I'm sure many of you know about, he called it the greatest advance in human knowledge in the history of humanity, the day that these uh, newspapers had published these results. And the reason for saying so is that it was the earliest possible data that ever existed in the universe about the universe. 
And he said, surely, adding on to this, it was worthy of many, many Nobel Prizes. So we confirmed something. Remember the theme today is confirmation. We confirmed what we wanted to see. It wasn't that we actually accidentally, serendipitously discovered something, a much more pure, accidental form of discovery. We set out and sought out a signal to detect, and lo and behold, we found it. Nothing wrong with doing that. It's just a different class of scientific discovery when you go to confirm a hypothesis that someone else has put forth. So we thought to ourselves this, this all along, it could be something other than what we were seeking, namely dust. So these two uh, housekeepers are talking about all the interstellar dust, not just the dust in the room that they're cleaning. Next, please. And I want to talk very briefly about what dust does. So dust does a few things. It makes the light from a distant object appear dimmer, which the human brain and computers even will interpret as greater distance. So if you see two light posts that have the same wattage light bulb on top, one through a dusty window, one through an open window, the one through the dusty window will appear diminished and it will appear into your mind and brain that it's farther away, when in fact they're the same distance. Next, please. It also makes the light redder. And it turns out that we're cruising on a spaceship on Earth through a very dusty window or through a very dusty cloud, and that cloud is the Milky Way galaxy. It's rotten with all those elements that we were singing about. Almost every single one of those elements, except for helium and hydrogen, were formed in stars in our own galaxy, including the calcium and the iron in the hemoglobin that flows in your veins right now. So you are literally stardust. Next, please. And we look at other galaxies have these behaviors of dust, too. Their other galaxies are rotten with dust. They're filthy, darn it. Next one, please. So this is what we think our galaxy looks like. It's, it's, it's basically completely filthy. And we should not have been surprised, nor were we. It's that essentially we jumped the gun and didn't do enough analysis. We just stopped analyzing the, the results when we felt confident that they were truly indicative of the origin of the universe the way that we wanted to see it. Next. And even Edwin Hubble, the famous astronomer, had to confront dust. This is what dust uh, looks like to his telescope. And next slide, if you have an advanced space telescope, this is what it would look like to you. These are all dust emissions. All these other galaxies are filled with dust. It might be the most important object in the universe. Next. And yet nobody ever talks about what it actually is. So you hear, oh, we're stardust. OK, we're stardust, but so is the flame of a candle. Why is that? Well, the candle is made of linen, the wick is made of linen, the wax is made of carbohydrates and oils. Those are part of the earth, right? We got them in some way from the earth. The linen actually grew up from minerals from the earth. And so when you burn them, you're burning parts of ancient earth. Where did that come from? That came from the interstellar medium. When a star blew up, the stardust went out into the galaxy. That's how stardust gets produced. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, dust makes things look dimmer, redder, as I said before. That's the sun, sunset on the left and sun at high noon straight overhead. So dust makes things look much dimmer and redder. Next, please. And here's just an animation. Maybe click it, <coughs> click it one more time, please. Uh, see if this will start up. This is how dust got to be there in the first place. When a star explodes, it shoots its material out into the interstellar medium, <coughs> which is the region that surrounds the stars in our galaxy. This is in the Milky Way galaxy, all the dust that I'm talking about. We see it in other galaxies, which gives us confidence in the model that we're talking about. As these objects uh, you know, coalesce and, co and, and, and come together and combine, they form meteorites, asteroids, things like that, that eventually will land on the Earth, some of them. Some believe life may have been seeded on Earth from distant stellar systems carrying on these rocks and crystals of dust uh, and then landing on the Earth's early surface. You can skip ahead, it's not going to tell us too much more. And indeed, these dust grains can align themselves in the Milky Way's magnetic field produce a polarized, twisting, curling pattern identical to what we saw. And actually, we had to retract our claim of seeing the beginning of time in this inflationary epoch. Next. So instead of this pristine image where you look out from Earth and see all the way back to the beginning of time, next slide, you actually are seeing through this very cloudy, dusty window that looks an awful lot like Los Angeles. OK, so <laughs> next slide, please. So the pale blue dot, you, you heard about that earlier. I'm not going to repeat it. But it's pretty interesting that Sagan calls it a moat of dust hanging suspended in a sunbeam. Very poetic. And that's the circle. That's the dot. That's where we live. That's a giant ball of dust. And inside our blood are gi giant grains of dust flowing through our hemoglobin molecules. Yes. Next one, please. There are some people, stardust, golden, like the bookmarks that I will give you that are made of real fake Nobel Prize gold if you buy the book. So they also destroys and blows away in the dust my chances at Nobel. Dumb. Next slide, please. There we go. There it got blown away. Next slide. 
But it, uh, I, I take good comfort because there's been a lot of controversy with the Nobel Prize lately, including our dear leader being nominated for not last year, this year. So stay tuned in October, he may win it. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Literature was canceled last year because of a, of a scandal involving uh, some things that men and women sometimes do, which they shouldn't do. Uh, <laughs> and then there are actually an organized crime unit looking into the finances of the Nobel Committee. It's really undergoing a lot of controversy. Next slide, we're gonna finish up. Skip over this one. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about are women and the Nobel Prize. So I was asked to nominate the winners of the Nobel Prize the next year. So it'd be kinda like somebody, you ask somebody to speak at your Sunday assembly, and they say, well, I'd like to speak at a better Sunday assembly. Can you make a recommendation, please? So I was asked to nominate, and I went back in Alfred Nobel's will, and I talk about this confidentiality that I violated in the, in the book, uh, how I did that. But I want to trace back the original, one of the biggest problems of the Nobel Prize is involves sexism. And it traces back, some say, to Alfred Nobel, who left almost all his wealth to the Nobel Prize. He had no children of his own. He left $200,000 worth of money to his two nephews and only $100,000 to his one niece. So the women got uh, half as much as the men. Next slide, we're about done. Here are all the women who have ever won the Nobel Prize in physics. They fit on one slide uh, with plenty of room to spare, and that's pretty bad. Next slide. Although this year, someone did just win it. One of my friends at Caltech won the Nobel Prize, and look at the headline they showed here. Caltech mom wins Nobel Prize. Son is JVL technician. And when Maria Mayer won, go back one slide, Maria Mayer was here in San Diego. The Union Tribune put in 1963, San Diego housewife wins Nobel Prize. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, I want to finish up with a dose of humility from none other than Mahatma Gandhi, who was a great man who avoided a lot of death and destruction in his life. And he said, the seeker after truth should be humbler than the dust. The world crushes dust under its feet. But you should so humble yourself that the dust could crush you. And when you do, and only when you do, will you have a glimpse at the essence of truth. Next. And I think we're done. So pardon our dust. We have to pardon it in the universe. We're building a new experiment. I'll skip over the new experiment. It's called the Simon's Observatory. Simon says, look at this observatory. Next slide. <laughs> These are the patrons of it. Next slide. We're building a giant super sucker in space. To su no, we're not doing that. That would be stupid. <laughs> Next slide. We're building new telescopes, new detectors, new technology, and computing resources in Chile at almost 17,000 feet above sea level. You're welcome to come and visit. Next slide. <laughs> That's our logo. That's where it is. Next slide. Almost the last slide. New technology I can talk about if people have questions. And last slide, I believe. Last slide. There we go. Thank you guys very much. I'm happy to uh, take questions and <laughs> comments and requests. Happy. Brian, thank you so much. That yes. was fantastic. I hope that um, we can put a, a pin in for when you were writing the book, winning the Nobel Prize. And you're coming <laughs> back and talk to us. You won't be too famous then, and you'll still think of us, because that was just fantastic. Um, uh, once again, the inimitable and uh, busy and tech savvy, <laughs> Mr. Paul Svensson. And, uh, and I always forget to do this, so after that, we do have a youth group. Uh, uh, if you want to join that, that uh, Candelario is back there in the back. So if there's any uh, young people that would like to join that uh, for the rest of the afternoon, please go and do so. Thank you very much. And Paul. So uh, I, I thought it would be ironic if you actually won a Nobel Prize in literature for your book about losing the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Sort of an indictment of the educational system, or or it's an indictment of hormones versus academia, or it's just a fun old song to sing. So let's just do that. Don't know much about history. Don't know much biology. Don't know much about science books. Don't know much about the French I took But I do know that I love you And I know that if you love me too What a wonderful world this would be Don't know much about geography 
Don't know much trigonometry Don't know much about algebra Don't know what a slide rule is for But I do know one and one is two And if this one could be with you What a wonderful world is About the Middle Ages Open the book I turn the pages Don't know nothing About my rise and fall I don't know nothing About nothing at all But I do know That I love you And I know That you love me too What a wonderful world This La 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 science book La 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 which I took But I do know that I love you And I know that you love me too What a wonderful world this would be What a wonderful world this Thank you, Paul. Now it's time for a per personal moment. This is a story out of one of your lives. Uh, so we hope that you will consent to share something, a story that uh, funny or heartbreaking or uh, anything that you care to uh, share with us. Uh, Kristen is somebody to see. If you want to uh, do a personal story, you can talk to her after the group because we'd love to have you and we'd love to hear the stories. Today we're gonna hear from Sandra Medina. Hello, my name is Sandra. I uh, grew up in the desert, and uh, you know the Looney Tunes uh, uh, Roadrunner and Coyote scenes. I kind of saw some of those. Uh, not exactly like the Looney Tunes, uh, but pretty similar. So I knew that the Roadrunner was a real animal. I knew the Coyote was a real animal. and. Um, the tumbleweeds were just sort of like the annoying things that I had to clean up of my dad's car or truck or uh, the driveway. And um, so because I grew up in the desert, I also uh, knew that there were some water creatures that uh, existed but that I had never seen in real life. Um, and I, I was also pretty curious. And I remember using uh, trips to the local zoo, which was a small zoo, sort of like um, as an opportunity to confirm the existence of different animals. So I was a little kid, saw an elephant. Oh, it's real, check. Uh, giraffe, check. Um, armadillo, check. Well. To be honest, just about the armadillo, I actually saw some in boots, in some of my uncle's boots, uh, people around me. It was, this was Texas. So I kind of confirmed the armadillo before the zoo. Um, but then, well, and because I thought that the water creatures were so magical and everything, I just thought about zoos and mermaids and, and um, whales and seahorses and dolphins. They were just all magical like, and magnificent uh, to me. So fast forward a few years and um, we did a, a senior trip to the ocean. And we went to an aquarium. And that was my very first time uh, going to an aquarium. And of course this was before the SpongeBob times, so the awareness of the creatures of the sea was not very high, at least not for a desert kid like myself. So 
when I, when I got to the aquarium and I started exploring, it was sort of like, imagine one of those movie scenes where you know something magical is about to happen, and then the, the background music is awesome, and, and then a lot of the background disappears, and then you see one thing. That was sort of my experience when I saw a seahorse. Because, just like I knew that the Roadrunner was kind of like a real animal, but you know, the cartoon road, road, uh, Roadrunner uh, was actually a real animal, I was convinced that the cartoon seahorses that I saw all through my childhood uh, were not real. I was convinced they were not. I was like, they're, they're too cool to be real. So my experience with the aquarium at that time was just sort of like a movie scene. And that is really one of the few things that I remember about the entire trip. It was just realizing that the seahorses were real. That was pretty cool. Uh, and um, so uh, later on as an adult, I've had the opportunity to tell people that the Looney Tune Roadrunner is real. And I have had the opportunity to see how their face changes, sort of like with wonder and joy when they realize that it's real. And I like to think that that was sort of like my face at the aquarium that day. So realizing that you were wrong for decades, sometimes, um, uh, could be a, a joyful experience. It could be a joyful experience and a wonderful experience. And um, one that could bring a smile to your face every time that you think about it. Like my experience uh, realizing that the seahorses were real. Thank you. <laughs>